Hello, hello, and welcome. Uh, very exciting to see a bunch of folks loading into our room right now. I'm going to take a look at some of our great attendees. I see so many friends of Target 100 are here. Hello, Andrea Mastro Giovanni and Donna Fry and Kim. Very nice to see all of you guys. Um, I have such an amazing special guest who I've asked to be with us tonight. Uh, after meeting Dr. Thomas Hemingway uh, via Instagram, honestly, we kind of connected there and uh, I was on uh, his podcast just a couple of weeks ago that came out, which we will repost so you guys can hear that. Uh, I asked uh, Dr. Hemingway to be there with me uh, to talk to you guys because I found him to just be such a a bright light and someone who would fit in so well in this amazing community uh, here where we are always trying to live our best lives. So just for you guys, so you know a little bit more, uh, Dr. Hemingway is a board certified uh, physician, most importantly, a father of six and a surfer. <laughs> um, you have your own uh, health podcast, which we will put up in the chat and make sure that people follow you there. Um, you recently authored a book called Preventable, Five Powerful Practices to Avoid Disease and Build Unshakable Health. Um, but most important to me uh, that I would really took away from you is, is that you are a holistic and integrative physician, right? That for me was really what sparked my interest in you and that you believe in prevention over prescription. And that is everything to me is like, can we keep people from that disease state so they never go there? Can we do the things that are simple and your talent and your, your warmth and your ability to distill difficult concepts into very uh, user-friendly explanations was why I wanted to have you here. So welcome. Oh, wow. That was so kind. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. As we say in Hawaii, aloha to everyone. Such, such an amazing gift to be here with you. Thank you. Well, I feel like we made a fast friendship the minute we met. So um, I'm glad to share you here. Um, I have an incredible community of folks who I'm sure will, I want you all to feel very free to, to type your questions in the chat as I'm speaking here. Um, you know, we're, uh, uh, you know, I will be watching and we will bring those questions to the table, okay? So this is an interactive, conversation, not just with me, but with everyone who's here. So, you know, when I saw some of the wonderful topics that you sent through as we were brainstorming around what to talk about together, I thought, you know, we have six pillars at Target 100. I shared all of that with you. We've got food and water and movement, hydration, stress, and sleep. And I looked at yours and it was like, you are an uh, uh, absolutely integrating all of those things into your practice. And I decided to really ask us to focus tonight on food because you really believe that food is medicine and that you it, it can be used as a poison <laughs> and it can be used to cure. So I thought we would start there, but just letting you kind of expound on your beliefs around food and what you tell your patients. Oh, couldn't, couldn't agree more. And all of those principles, the six uh, main ones that you guys talk about all of the time, I agree with all of them so crucial, so critical. And I really believe food to be kind of first and foremost front and center, because literally it can be the best possible medicine for us. Or like Liz said, it could be even a slow poison, potentially. Even Hippocrates, one of the sort of original famous physicians that we love to quote said, let medicine be thy food and food be thy medicine. And that was literally in the same paragraph that many people uh, are familiar with, with physicians, we sort of take this Hippocratic oath, which says, first, we're going to do no harm. And almost immediately after that, within about a sentence or two, it talks about how we should be using food to be medicine and be prescribing food and food habits and things like that. So it's, it's been around for millennia, really. And I think the cool thing is it's coming back around to where we're starting to see that hey, that, that is still important. You know, if we take, I think for too many years, for over a hundred anyway, we focused a lot on that dreaded C word, right? The calories, you know, and it, it's a very interesting concept that really started out in the early 1900s. And it's, I think it's obvious to all of us, and Liz talks about this a lot, that we know intuitively 
that, for example, 100 calories of broccoli is different than 100 calories of Oreo cookies. Like it's our body does not burn these things in a vacuum and just release energy. It's, it's not like that. Food is information. It does so many other things in the body, not just an energy or a fuel source. And, say, and so treating food as our best possible medicine with all the nutrients that it can have is just foundational. And as we do that, I mean, it just makes you glow. You feel so much better. I mean, if you ate a cup of broccoli or ate two Oreo cookies, although they might have a similar amount of calories, you're not going to feel the same afterwards. Mm -hmm. And for days and years, if you do that behavior repeatedly, there'll be differences, right? I mean, it's, we all know this. My kids, as Liz mentioned, I have six kids. Like they know this stuff. This is, yeah. we're kind of, you know, we grow up kind of knowing it intuitively, but when we actually start to use simple, simple practices like using our food as not only energy, which it is, but also as nourishment, as the information that tells our bodies how to behave in certain ways, turns genes on, turns genes off. I mean, it really can be a mar marvelous and miraculous force in our life. So it's just, it's foundational. I love that you're talking about food because I shared with you, you know, my dad was a surgeon and, you know, they're in, you know, he had zero, I think he told me they spent maybe a week in his training talking about food in general. So his and his eating habits were really, really poor. And he actually ended having ended up having a sex tuple bypass at 57. Wow. Oh yeah, my gosh. Bypasses in one surgery after smoking and eating poorly and you know being a doctor. So hearing you as this holistic integrative, it excites me so much because that that combination is very rare where a doctor understands nutrition at the same time and prescribes it. So what are you know some of your, you know, when someone walks in and and you have, you know, you want to help that person make a turn, what do you say to them? Well, here's here's the thing. When, you know, when we look at just let's just talk the US, because that's the data I'm familiar with. Most of us, sadly, don't eat a lot of variety in our diets. And so what I love to promote and share with people is that there is so much more out there that we could be eating that's healthful, beneficial, and we're literally barely scratching the surface. There's over 300,000 different edible vegetables, fruits, et cetera, that we could be eating. And the data shows that we, at least in America, we eat 200 or less species of plants and animals. And there's literally 300,000 available to us. And even more sad than that is three of them make up over 50% of our calories worldwide. There's a close fourth and I'll share those real quickly. And you could probably just it. guess this, right? I, so I so wheat, wheat, corn, and um, wheat, corn, soy. And the fourth is Oh, I'm spacing. What am I thinking? Wheat, corn, uh, soy. No, 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 no. Uh, I'm, I'm for some reason, my mind, I'm drawing a blank, but, but basically the, oh, rice, duh. So, so wheat, corn, soy, and rice make up over 60% of the calories we consume worldwide. And that's four plants, only four. And so I would just ask you, just think about your last couple of days. Like how many different plants did you eat vegetables, fruits, or even you know, if you eat animal foods as well, fish and these kinds of things, which are great pasture raised chicken and eggs and things like that are great too. But how many different things did you eat in the last two days? Can you name a dozen? Can you name two dozen? I mean, one of my favorite things in the world, and Liz knows this because I've shared in Hawaii, for example, we have these farmers markets and there are literally fruits that look so crazy exotic. Like you don't even know what they are. They're purple and they're all different colors and they, they just look, you know, like, have you ever seen a, a fruit that looks like a purple artichoke? Like there's fruit that looks like that. Like it's just crazy stuff. There's so many things that we can add to our diet. So I love to use the philosophy of adding rather than subtracting because there's so many options out there. Let me just give you a quick example. So yeah. there's really only three things that I counsel my patients and those that I work with to subtract from their diet. That's it. Three things. Okay. They are the highly processed grains. Yeah. highly processed sugars, and then the bad oils, the seed oils. These are all of the things that we were told for many years were healthful, right? The vegetable oils, the safflower, the canola, the soybean oil, the rice bran oil. 
these we were told, you know, 20, 30 years ago that they were good for us because we made them. They were man-made and they were highly processed and they were supposed to take the place of like animal fats, for example, lard and butter and tallow. And it turns out that they're actually very much not healthy because they're inflammatory. So there's really only three things to avoid. That's all I'm telling you, those three things. That's it, oil, simple. Highly processed grains and highly processed sugars. Can you yeah. just, for, for the audience, talk a little bit about, we just did a big webinar around processed versus highly processed. Okay. From your perspective, when you say a highly processed grain, what are they doing to that grain that's so bad for us? Oh my goodness. So <laughs> I don't know if people are familiar with what like a wheat plant normally would look like. Um, Usually, if you've ever seen an actual, like if you were to grow wheat in your backyard, like it'd be six to eight feet tall. Nowadays, the wheat that they use is this stuff called dwarf wheat, and it's only two or three feet tall, and it's very thick, and they can get huge yields in very small surface areas. So in other words, the, the yield of the crop is amazing. You know, you could feed millions of people in a lot less acreage, but what they have to do to make that even edible, digestible, and usable is they have to just pulverize it. So when you think about food, think about the stuff that's the most healthy is the stuff that you can just grab and eat, that you don't have to smash it up, blend it, beat it, you know, make it into finely tiny little particles, like anything you eat that comes in a package, what I call the three Bs in a bag, a box, or with a barcode, that stuff is highly processed. They literally have to pulverize it to make it edible. And then what that does, and I'm sure Liz has talked about that, but it increases what's called the glycemic index. So like if you take a piece of white bread, for example, the glycemic index for that is nearly as high as sugar. It's like in the seventies or eighties for a piece of bread. Whereas if you take a berry, a strawberry, a blueberry, what have you, that's going to be much less than 50. 50 is kind of that like middle range for glycemic index. And when you highly process something, whether it be a flour, like something from wheat, which would be gluten-based or corn. It doesn't really matter what it starts as, corn, oats, whatever. When you pulverize it, like I, I have to admit, as a kid, I ate that stuff called uh, Quaker Instant Oatmeal. Like not just the like plain yeah. stuff, but the stuff that was like berries and cream and peaches yeah. and cream and maple syrup. And yeah. I loved it. I mean, it was like candy for breakfast, but that stuff, like if I would have had a glucose monitor in those days, it would have been spiking my sugar through the roof because it's pulverized, highly processed. And then when you have those big, you know, spikes, guess what you're going to have following that you're going to have the dips. And then you're going to be like, Oh my gosh, I'm groggy. I don't have a lot of energy. I have low blood sugar, hypoglycemia. And that's because of those big spikes. So highly processed, sadly, right now in the U S makes up about 60% of the adult diet. And even more sadly in kids, the study just came out, I think three or four months ago, and it was about 70 some odd percent of a kid's diet is highly processed. I know this because I have kids in school right now and they tell me what's available for the school lunch. And we look at it together on the website and I'm like, what is that? Is that real food? Like those PB and J like things oh that come God, in a plastic that are like, yeah, yeah, it's like, what is that stuff? Like it's it's, it's crazy. Yeah. So so those are besides the fact that those highly processed grains, sugars, and the seed oils are super inflammatory. But besides that, they tend to really spike the blood sugar. And when you're on that blood sugar roller coaster, it's really not a pleasant place to be because you'll have energy for a minute or maybe even an hour, and then you'll dip and you'll be, you know, devoid of energy and you'll feel like you got to reach for the next thing. So yeah, not a, not an awesome place to be. And that, those are such great little, great recommendations. And I always take it that one step further to say like the simplicity of saying, you know, even some of these yogurts, right? Yogurt or the oatmeal is a great example. We were talking about oatmeal in the in the webinar that we did this week of like, you can get those packets, right? <laughs> of the highly processed. Then the next best, best step would maybe be just a plain packet of the mm -hmm. oatmeal, but that's still processed. I told yeah. them they're shaving those grains down so it cooks faster. So it's a convenience food. And then we go to that canister where it's a canister. You have to cook it. It takes the steel time. cut ones steel that like take ones. 30 minutes instead of two yeah. minutes to cook yeah. <laughs> like all those convenience foods or, or the yogurts, right? The highly, the, the highly processed sugar in the yogurts moving to something that's much less low in sugar, just maybe has fruit in it to, you know, a plain Greek yogurt, right? Those moves down and, and a, a plain Greek yogurt with a drizzle of real honey versus you know, you know, that kind of putting real fruit in there to try and make it really usable for folks. So it's not like, oh my God, I can't eat any of what I ever ate before. 
but there's a trajectory that you could move down. Yeah. And there's so much, there's so much choice out there, really. Like I said, you know, a few minutes ago, there's so many options. We just have to be open to it. It might look different than what we're doing now, than the convenience of grabbing the little yo play that I used to eat. I'll be honest. I was an offender that I ate that too. Cause that's, we were in this whole low fat movement. Right. And so what did we do? We, we ate low fat, but necessarily it increased our carbs. Like if one of the macronutrients, protein, fat, or carbs goes down, one of the others, or maybe both go up. I mean, there's, it's simple. It's, it's not, it's not hard to understand, yeah. but, but yeah, sticking to the real simple ingredient stuff. Like you mentioned plain Greek yogurt. What I do is I do exactly what you said. I'll put berries on top, blueberries or strawberries typically. And I might drizzle a little bit of, of honey and, and locally, if you can get honey sourced in your area, it's gold because it has so many beneficial properties like the, the honeybees that are there, they're exposed to the same kinds of plants and, and potential, you know, allergens, if you will, that you might be exposed to. And if you have that honey, you'll be better off. Your immune system actually benefits from that, from your own local honey. So I, it's amazing. And it tastes, it tastes amazing. Like, I mean, a little drizzle, honey. <laughs> we, and that was our discussion. We, we called it scary food since it's October is this, this mindset that got set up that like having this trubia from which is owned by Pepsi yeah. and highly processed stevia. And they've called it Truvia and people think it's stevia and they think that's healthy, but they don't know that this has no resemblance to really the stevia at the end of the day that, you know, has a health halo around it. Whereas honey, people are like, oh, it's oh my so gosh. high in sugar, right? So it's like really breaking down these, these cultural norms around food that have grown into us through you know diet culture a lot of time is what we where we were coming mm -hmm. from but i just love this this idea of thinking of food as medicine but we're talking about really delicious food absolutely uh, think about i don't know if any of any of the folks uh, watching or viewing have been to say any place in europe the mediterranean italy portugal spain france these places they're like, if you've eaten the food that they prepare, like they're locally, you know, uh, done cuisine, it is amazingly tasty. It's rich. It's actually really, really healthy. I mean, we've all heard of the Mediterranean diet, right? That's where it comes from. And there's people there that routinely are living to be a hundred and beyond. That's one of the so-called blue zones, right? The centenarians in Italy, for example, and they're eating amazing foods and, and they're not, I, I, there's all this like low carb, zero carb keto movement. Like these guys eat carbs all the time, yeah. but, yeah. but the difference is, is their carbs are from real food. And if they eat bread and pasta, guess what? They make the bread and pasta and they make it with real wheat. They don't make it with that dwarf wheat that's pulverized that we use. And they ferment it like sourdough bread, the original sourdough bread from a starter. Yeah. That's actually good for you. It has probiotics in there. And I'll be honest, if I'm in Italy, I am eating the bread 100% every single time. I love fresh bread. I, here in the US, like I'm not buying a loaf of bread almost ever, but yeah. if I can get a hold of a good starter and sourdough, I'm all for it. I mean, yeah. I'm like the rest of us. I like that stuff. <laughs> I've done some um, retreats in Italy before, and we oh. stayed at this amazing spot. And the, the man is an incredible chef and has an olive press and makes his own olive oil and gardens and he was saying that the grain in the u.s you know they actually have grades uh, there's like zero one and zero zero one and one and all of these different these numbers that go around the, the grain itself they said that they wouldn't feed our our grain to their animals if their lives depended on it <laughs> and they're, they're using a grain for their animals that is four grades higher than what we use as for humans here. I, I totally believe it. <laughs> it's crazy, but it's, I just took a trip to Portugal and everything I saw there, everything I ate there was literally from the local vicinity. And it was amazing. And it was my first trip. I've been to Italy a few times, but this is my first trip to Portugal and the foods that they ate. It was so rich, so delicious. I mean, my taste buds were literally going bananas. I mean, so many different tastes and flavors. And I didn't feel deprived for a half a second. And yet it, this food was nourishing too. I mean, the nutrients that it has, like even this, this may sound crazy, but like, for example, everywhere we drove, we saw um, cows in the field grazing, just free range, free roaming, uh, grass-fed cattle and so on. And all their meat are from their local cattle, for example. So 
the stuff that they eat, th this is one thing we often forget. We often say this mantra that you are what you eat, which is totally true, but you are what you eat and what you have eaten has also eaten. And this goes for plants and animals, both. So if we eat plants, be it vegetables or fruits, and if they're highly sprayed with pesticides, well, they're going to have some issues that they will pass on to us because it actually wrecks their, what, what we call microbiome. And then we eat that and it wrecks ours. You know, this is, this is all that the stuff that we hear about, you know, the glyphosates and the GMO stuff. And that's why it's not so awesome because they literally have in, in them, their own genome, in their own genes, they literally are influenced by those pesticides. And so when we eat them, we also get influenced and it wrecks our little guys that live in us, this so-called microbiome or microbiota. So it goes downstream. So we have to pay attention to not only what we eat, but what we eat has eaten or been exposed to both plant and animals and also any of the meats. It's the same concept, but it's, you go to Europe or Italy, wherever you were saying, I mean, they don't have these same concerns because they let things happen naturally as they have been for millennia. They're not trying to, I, I feel like here in the U S we tried to outsmart nature, you know, like, oh, we can do it better. We can do GMO crops that can feed way more people on such less acreage. And we're going to end, end, end world hunger. Well, guess what? Right now today, and I don't know if your audience is familiar with this. So right now in the world, I'm not just talking US, in the world, we have more health conditions caused by being overfed or overweight and lack of real nutrition. So we are literally, what I, what I say simply, we are starving in a sea of plenty. We are overfed because we have high calorie stuff available, the processed stuff, yep. but we are nutrient deprived. And now obesity is a bigger problem worldwide than hunger. Yes. Like, and we thought we were solving the whole world's hunger problem with these GMO fields and stuff. We've actually made it much worse. It's, it's crazy, crazy stuff. But if we go back to what we used to do, eat real food. And, you know, use actual real wheat, not the dwarf wheat, and we don't pulverize it and we make it like the Italians do. I mean, we could learn a lot from that. <laughs> so much. And, and, you know, I'm trying to think of like actionable things for folks, you know, that, you know, eating that real food. And of course, we're always saying, you know, they're the cliche things of like, oh, shop the outside. Aisle. They're the perimeter. Yeah. Right. But I'm also thinking because I was in Greece this summer. And when I got back, I was so obsessed with like what they, what I was like, what just happened to me, right? The honey in Crete. I mean, it was just the honey on the yogurt and it was just so fantastic. So I found a local Greek market and same after coming back from Italy, I have a market that I go to where I get pasta from them, where I get, you know, like I get canned tomatoes from them. I get like so if you can, I'm thinking like people find local markets that are that are a little bit cuisine oriented or um, nationality or oriented, I would say. Um, and yeah, see if you can't, you know, I think even trading in the chat, you know, the things that that you, you, you know, and thinking about this as you go through your week, like, can you knock out a processed food? Can you, you know, take one thing out this week that is something from what did you say a box a barcode or a bag with a bag bag box yeah. and barcode yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then so, what and then in addition what can you add can you add one or two new foods this week is it is it a vegetable is it a fruit is it um some well-raised uh, protein i mean there's so many things out there liz mentioned you know going to the cuisine specific markets like an italian market or or what have you where they i mean they are sourcing their food better than most of us and and there's a lot of places where you can also get you know um familiar with your local farmers for example and you can get to know like how they are raising their crops or if you can have your own garden even more power to you. I mean, that's amazing. That's one of my goals right now with six kids and all kinds of other stuff going on. We, we don't have much of a garden, but that's one of my goals to do that too, because then you know exactly how your stuff has been raised. You know that you're not putting Roundup on it. You're not, you know, you know exactly where it's been and what's happening to it. And so if you can find local farmers and, and uh, her, you know, all, all those uh, sources locally, it's amazing. Go to your local farmer's yeah, markets. I, I mean- see so many of the farmer's markets, once you go to a local farmer's market, you'll see the same folks there. If you go a couple mm -hmm. of times, you're going to start seeing the same farms, you know, are there and you can get to know those folks and you can create a relationship there and have stuff during the winter, even, you know, things that, that they are, you know, canning and, and growing and, you know, saving and all the rest of it. So, so creating that, that relationship as well is a really strong point. And, you know, 
everything that we're talking about leads so nicely into that sort of other side that I wanted to talk about and, and that we've been sort of tiptoeing around it is this idea of these foods, these packaged processed foods and how they create information. And I was just watching one of your Instagram videos where you were talking about food as that inflammation sort of as, as a storm, right? You're <laughs> out in a storm, right? And you were like that, inf I hope that wasn't, you weren't down in Florida. It didn't look like it. So no, not that time, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, uh, you were likening it to that and how, yeah. you know, that, that inflammation is a process in the body that is, is important. It, it's, it's there for a reason and it's good for us in many situations, right? When we get an injury, I often teach people in Target 100, especially when they're losing weight and they go to the gym and they, they lift some weights and they're very sore, that they might see the scale go up the next day as their body gathers water and inflammation around that injury in order to bring the white blood cells there and heal it. Mm -hmm. So that sort of inflammation is good inflammation. Yeah. There are reasons that we want inflammation, but then it's become something that is, uh, you know, ongoing and chronic. So I just kind of wanted to hear from you on that. Yeah, no, you, you spoke it perfectly. There's the acute, which is the inflammation that happens right at the moment for either recovering from an injury or a wound or an infection, whatever that is, that's the good kind of inflammation. And it happens to help us, to protect us, to resolve whatever the issue is. And it doesn't last long. It lasts maybe hours to days. And then there's this ongoing chronic inflammation, which is kind of like that smoldering fire that really never goes away and that is what leads to not only the number one killer world, worldwide, which is heart disease, but it leads to diabetes, obesity, even most cancer is inflammation based. It's literally the common thread in almost every illness that exists other than like an acute injury, that would be different because that would be the, the fresh or acute type of inflammation that would be trying to heal the situation. But all these other conditions that we potentially could suffer from are really from that same root, which is inflammation, this ongoing fire, if you will, this ongoing storm that just never goes away. And what happens in the body is that our body tries to break down the inflammation by kind of building scar tissue, if you will. Think about um, the blood vessel, for example. If that is chronically exposed to inflammatory substances in our food, whether they be the seed oils or the very, very poor hydrogenated oils, which somehow in the, in the U S are still available. I, I can't even understand this one. They literally were outlawed about six or eight years ago, yet they have this kind of grace period where they can still put them in our food for another decade or two. Like as, as folks have said in the chat, this stuff is not even allowed in Europe and yet we still allow it in our food. It's just crazy. Anything that says hydrogenated, put that back, run away. Don't use it. Don't buy it. I mean, that is among the most inflammatory. So what the body does to protect itself is it literally lays down scar tissue and that will narrow the blood vessel over the process. And so when it gets narrowed, that's when we're more at risk for the heart attack, for the stroke, for the kidney disease. All of these things are from inflammation. In fact, the newest marker to be able to look um, in what we call a most sensitive way. In other words, when you want to find something, you want to use the most sensitive test, the one that's going to pick up everything. It may not be super specific. It may not tell you this is from heart disease, but it will tell you that inflammation is going on. And we have a measure of that. It's called the highly sensitive C-reactive protein or the HSCRP. And that's a measure of inflammation that your doctor can check. And if your level is like zero zilch nada, you're in fantastic shape as far as you have a very low risk of heart disease, a very low risk of ongoing issues that could lead to cancer, for example, lots of things you can find if, if you can have this level really low. The problem is a lot of us have it elevated and we don't even know it. We don't no, even we know don't it. Feel this. This you don't necessarily feel it. Yeah. Feel, it's, it's right? like the high blood pressure issue, right? We call it in medicine, the silent killer, because most of us don't even feel it. And yet it's wreaking havoc on our blood vessels, causing inflammation, causing the scar tissue, causing the narrowing. And it happens slowly over the years. So we don't want chronic inflammation. We don't want that. And so Liz and I were chatting about this before we did this, like, what could we help you guys with? Like, how could we help you with an anti-inflammatory diet? And so I actually, um, I drew a picture and my, my daughter has it, so I, I can't show it to you, but it was really colorful. So right now it's fall. And a lot of us get the opportunity to see many different colors in the leaves. And it's so beautiful. I missed this for the many decades I've been in Hawaii. And this year, 
I'm not in Hawaii in the fall and I can see all these different colors and anti-inflammatory foods are the colorful ones. Our bodies literally crave the color in the same way our eyes, we love to see it. So think about the purples, the reds, the yellows, the oranges, the bright greens, like these are the great anti-inflammatory foods and what they have in them our a couple of different properties. One are antioxidants. Think about all those fruits that, that you're familiar with. And then think of the ones that you've never even seen before. Like in Hawaii, we have lychee and we have rambutan and we have all of these dragon fruit and star fruit and all this kind of stuff that you may not see other places, but you should look for them. Look for them at your local markets. These are very high in anti-inflammatory properties. They have antioxidants, they have anthocyanins, they have um, polyphenols. You know, these are really great things which do the opposite of what I was just talking about, raise blood pressure. They actually lower blood pressure and they lower inflammation. Now talking about the greens, think about things that are super green and bright, right? Mm -hmm. The different spinach and kales. And my favorite is the avocado. Avocado is actually very anti-inflammatory. And contrary to what I was taught when I was a kid, like, oh my gosh, it's high fat. You got to be aware and not eat avocados. Mm -hmm. I wanted to show you that literally today, um, be, be, right before we did this, I ate an entire avocado and my daughter was sitting next to me and she's like, can I have some? So I cut a second one and she literally sat down and ate the entire thing just with a spoon. We, we yeah. sprinkle a little bit of salt on it and it's amazing. It tastes so good and it's very anti-inflammatory. It's actually great for heart health. It also but has the, fiber in it. Many of the diet programs, the weight loss programs here in the U S the avocado still is, is, is it's awful. like red flag, right? Yeah. If you look <laughs> at like a, the points value that it's given on, uh, on weight watchers, it's like off the charts. Like if you eat it, you know, mm -hmm. like, you know, those kinds of things, that's, that's how far behind our food, you know, science you know, or our, our weight loss science yeah. is really stuck in the 1980s. It has not come forward. So it's in talking to sort of these forward thinking people like you who are really looking at some of the new research around this stuff. I love this, the, the idea, like, I think like the theme of our conversation that's coming out tonight is like just colorful, colorful, colorful. I was thinking I had beets in my yeah. salad tonight Yay. And how, you know that that those deep reds and and how you know in my local grocery store it's just so bland right there are <laughs> apples and there are bananas and they're you know it is kind of very like not very exciting out yeah. there but you can do little things to, to get those bright colors in, even in a, just an everyday grocery store, right? Spinach versus iceberg lettuce is going to be a, a huge, massive change in terms of anti-inflammatory yeah. properties for you. So. Yeah, no, the, I love that you mentioned that it is the, the sort of dietary science, food science part hasn't really caught up with the new data. I mean, the second thing I was about to mention, besides my favorite, the avocado is olive oil, for example, we talked about that briefly when we talked about the Mediterranean diet, like they use olive oil for everything, right? They're dipping their bread in it. They're using it for their salad dressing. They use it in all of their cooking. Like in, in many programs, olive oil would be, you know, red flag because it's oil, right? It's like, oh my gosh, it's got too much fat. Well, well, the interesting thing is it also has other healthful, beneficial antioxidant and healthful anti-inflammatory properties. But when you eat, starting with things like protein and fat, guess what? Your body gets a little bit more full and satiated a lot sooner. So you don't crave more and more and more, which is exactly why we do crave things like chips and crackers and cookies. And, and we literally, just like the, the, the marketing says, you can't eat just one, right? You eat one and then it's two and then it's 10 and then it's half a bag. And then it's the whole bag. Like I used to do this with ice cream. Like I couldn't sit down and eat just one little tiny bowl of ice cream. I'd eat half the carton or maybe I'd eat the whole carton because it's so dang like addictive and it's prepared that way, right? There's food scientists that prepare it just that way on purpose because they want us to eat it like crazy. Like it's, it's kind of, I don't know, I hate to use the word evil, but a little bit nefarious, right? That, that they're literally yeah. making this stuff so that we'll want to eat it more and more and more. And it's not... And, and I know Liz is great at this, but it's not anybody being weak. It's not lack of oh. willpower. This is like the science, like they are doing this on purpose. But if you eat, food. yeah, if you eat real food, like literally that will satiate you, not only because of this has fat and it has saturated fat, but also it has a nutrient value that 
these other processed foods don't have. So we're literally, like I said earlier, starving in a sea of plenty. Our body wants more and more because it lacks the nutrients. If we're eating processed foods, we can't get many nutrients. So our body says, hey, you got to keep eating because you got to get those nutrients somehow. And so you keep eating more and more calories. And it's, it's not good for our health. It's great for all the companies that are producing these foods because they're just saying cha-ching all the way to the bank, but it's not helpful for us. And so when we stick to the real foods, especially the healthy proteins, the healthy fats, not only are they really satiating, but they do have additional nutrient value. That's not going to leave us sort of hungry for more, hungry for the, for the nutrients that we're lacking. So. That's so, so well said. And I just keep thinking, you know, there, that low glycemic index, you know, I, I think is a wonderful way to think about things. But even when I'm putting it into sort of layman's terms, it's like, you know, first thing, you know, when we were at Weight Watchers, we did some of these tests where we would actually have somebody sit and have flavored yogurts. And we say, you just have as many as you want. And they would eat three, four, five yogurts as they sat there. And then we'd sit them down and say, here's a plain Greek yogurt. You can have as many as you want. And they would just eat one, not maybe even make it all the way through the one because <laughs> they were highly satisfied by it. Didn't have all the sugar and all the addictive properties. Right. So it's those foods that I always say, if you opened your fridge and it was filled with apples, would you eat one? Right. And, and if you ate one, would you then eat the entire fridge full of apples? You probably wouldn't. Right. It just, those foods that you eat. So that avocado, like that's my favorite snack. I'll cut a, a half of avocado, drizzle it with olive oil, so oh, wow. salt and pepper, oh, and wow. have it with a spoon. And it's just like the greatest snack. And it's so satisfying. It makes you feel so different than eating something processed or, you know, uh, sort of laden in, in these chemicals and, and highly inflammatory foods. It's very different. So um, I have one question here. What if you're yeah. allergic to some of these fruits, like the avocado, et cetera? It sounds yeah, to me like there's a big variety out there. That there's might- yeah, there's a lot of choices. Here's here's my second favorite snack right here, yes, and and, and <laughs> Liz is going to get one of these in the mail soon. I just returned from Hawaii, and it's my favorite snack besides the avocado. It's got to be at least a close second. I I love macadamia nuts. I love all nuts, and and nuts are high in fat, but they're high in protein. They're high in fiber. There's nutrients there. I mean, you just name me a nut and I can tell you lots of nutrients. The one that I wouldn't recommend you eat a lot of is, is <laughs> the Brazil nut because you only need like one or two of those a day. They have a lot of selenium, which many of us are, are deficient in, but you don't need to eat a lot of those. And, and you wouldn't want to like, you know, if you've ever eaten a Brazil nut, they're, they're pretty big. They're kind of like the size yeah. of a walnut and you eat like two yeah. of those and you're like, okay, that's enough. <laughs> these, these, I can't eat just one. I want to eat two or three oh or four yeah. because they're so yummy. And the only thing on this one is just sea salt. And that's it. Two ingredients, macadamia nuts. And the second is sea salt. <laughs> that's probably, and, macadamia nuts are one of my favorite snacks and I will just measure them out. I get big bags like that mm-hmm. as well. And I measure them out again. One of those things that I like to tell people, and you were going there as well, is like, how do you feel after you eat this food? Yeah. I will, you know, because I often have to do many Zooms in a row and like, I don't want to, you know, eat too much because you just then sit here. And you dip later. Like you know. 10 or 12 macadamia nuts. And I'm just, I feel energized and satisfied. And it's like a feeling of very even versus getting logged down or, or hyper or, you know, just having that roller coaster and it holds me for a very long time, a very small amount of that. So mm-hmm. finding, I think connecting where you're saying, which is just really, how do you feel after you eat those foods? You know, like I, I felt bad, my husband, David, I was telling you he's a Broadway actor. Today is a Jewish holiday, Yom Kippur, where you actually, you fast all day. And so we all fasted, even my boys fasted today till usually you do it till sundown, but he had to leave for his show and he bought bagels and I made a salad and I roasted some butternut squash. Like I was like, I, I've been down this road before where you break the fast and you're just like downing bagels, like there's no tomorrow. <laughs> and he was so hungry. He downed a bagel like so fast. And he, he literally texted me from the train going into work. He was like, cause we never eat bagels. Like, it's just like not really a thing except on a holiday like this. He was like, I feel so awful right now. He's like, I'm tired. I don't know how I'm going to do the show. It feels like I have a brick in my stomach. So it's like, oh my gosh, 
how do you feel after those yeah. foods? Ne right? Next time you're going to supply them with this, but uh, <laughs> that, that's what I teach my kids too, because uh, it, it's, you know, like many of us are parents and, and Liz has boys, as I know, and I do too. Yeah. And, and like, they want to eat whatever, right? They want to eat pizza. They want to eat this. They want to eat that. And, and I let them, I mean, we primarily shop with the real stuff that doesn't even need a label, you know, the fruits, the vegetables, the, the good proteins out there. And then, you know, they'll go out to a friend's party and they'll eat a bunch of pizza or whatever. And then afterwards they're like, dad, oh, I don't feel that good. Like my stomach aches, or maybe they went to a birthday party and they had a couple slices of cake and they're like, Ooh, like, I don't feel good. Like, and so you just, you know, you recognize it. And I'm not saying you can't eat that stuff. Hey, I have at least six, you know, if I count mine and my wife's eight birthdays a year that I got to celebrate, I'm having cake on every single one of them, you know, or at least I'm having a couple of scoops of ice cream because I love ice cream. That's just my thing, but I'm not eating it every single day, but you know, it's okay to eat this stuff once in a while. You just don't need to eat it every day, right? It's okay to yeah. eat it, but you know, yeah. it, well, it's fine. But then just fo follow your, your sort of gut feeling, you know, that we all know what we feel like. Like when Liz said, when we just down a bagel super quickly and we're like, Oof, like I kind of wanted that, but later I'm like, why did I do that? I've, I've never had that feeling when I take a handful of nuts. It's never happened that way. <laughs> no, um, you know what I was thinking is because you're so good at explaining things, can you explain just sort of physiologically what inflammation is? Yeah, absolutely. So, so inflammation, whether it be in that setting that happens abruptly to help resolve an injury or a wound or what have you, it's basically you get a flood of helpful cells. These are your, usually their white blood cells and they go to kind of solve the problem. They are going to, if it's an infection, they're going to try to get rid of that pathogen, whether it be a bacteria, a virus, whatever the thing is, they're going to kind of take over and fix the problem. And in addition to them, these helpful guys called the white blood cells, you also have a flood of what we call cytokines. And I think many of us heard this word for the first time in the last couple of years, the cytokine storm, right? That yeah, was happening yeah. during the pandemic. And that's what was making people really sick. It wasn't just this, you know, little virus. It was actually the flood of what we call inflammatory mediators, which is like the signaling. It's like all of us have, have a phone, right? And we can text message our friends, family, whatever. It's kind of like, if you were to imagine you got like, a hundred text messages all in one second. You're, you know, your phone is just being bombarded. This is what it's like in inflammation. You just have all of these messages being sent out to recruit. You know, the purpose of it is to recruit these cells to say, hey, come and fix this problem, whether it be infection, injury, whatever. But if you have that going on every single day, day after day, not only does it wear your system out, if you will, like the, the, the helpful guys, the white blood cells, it kind of wears them out and actually over time will make you more likely to suffer from infections and other things because they're just tired. They're worn out. They never had a break. Yeah. They're literally on guard, active every single day when there's inflammation going on because of this messaging. Those cytokines are telling them, hey, come over here, help us out. We have something going on. And so that's what got people really sick during you know the last couple of years was this cytokine storm because all of these cells were overworked essentially and when they are overworked your body kind of suffers from that and these mediators these cytokines this messaging it makes not only them come but but all of the blood flow increases you get swollen you get achy you know we all know what it's like to have an injured say we sprain our ankle right the next day it's even worse like the second day and then the third day it's like three times the size as the first day like what the heck <laughs> Well, that's, that's inflammation. And so if we have something like that happening day after day after day, that's why it's not good for our body. So that's kind of what's happening during the inflammation. These, you know, messengers, um, if you will, the cytokines that are recruiting those cells to try to fix the problem, but they can't be doing that every single day, 365 days a year, they need a break too. Right. So that's why we yeah. don't want chronic inflammation. This, this is why you are like a national treasure because you just told this story and you pulled in something that we all can relate to, right? Those text messages coming in and that, that, that sort of that, you know, that, that storm happening. And that's so helpful, I think. And that, that the food choices that we make can reduce that storm. There are lots of other choices we can make that help reduce that storm as well. What are some of your top, you know, inflammation busting, you know, uh, recommendations? Yeah, they're, they're actually really similar to yours. I mean, uh, besides food, there's a couple other things that are big levers. I like to do the things that have the biggest effect, the biggest result 
with the smallest amount of work, right? Who, who, yes. wouldn't, who wouldn't want that? We want to have That's a big right. effect and not have to do a lot of work. So the other thing is sleep. Sleep doesn't take a lot of effort. Like we just, we have to make sure we do it. And it, I, I have just right here on my phone, I know it's crazy and seems silly, but I have a timer that goes off every night at 10 o'clock. And it's like, Hey, bedtime, you know, this is the deal. And you got to, you know, and so I'm like, Oh crap, if I'm in the middle of work or whatever, I wrap things up. I take an hour just to kind of decompress. I read a book. When I get into bed, it's dark, it's cool. It's quiet. I don't have any blue lights hit me in the face. Like, you know, sleep is really a superpower that most of us don't take advantage of. It's super, super easy. And it starts when you wake up in the morning, go out and get five minutes of sunlight, wherever you are in the world. If you can, even if it's cold, try to have the sun hit your eyes for five minutes in the morning. That's it. It sets your clock. And that will be one of the simplest. It requires the least amount of time and it may help you get a great night's sleep, just exposing your body to real, normal, natural light. And then when it comes down to getting ready for bed, we often, I have teenagers as does Liz, we often use this word curfew. So in the same way that there should be a curfew on these things, the devices, there should be a curfew, but there should be a curfew on our food. We shouldn't be eating yes. right before bed. We should have a food curfew. We should yeah. wait. My goal is always three hours. It doesn't always happen, but three hours is kind of my goal. I try to not eat any calories between, you know, three hours to when I lay my head down to the pillow, I can drink water. I can have some tea, whatever that looks like, but I don't eat any calorically dense stuff right before bed because that activates this whole digestive process, which is actually really taxing. <laughs> One of the problems, in, and I don't know if you talk about this, but in today's society, on average, we are eating 16 or more hours out of the day, which is like, when we think about what we've been doing for thousands of years, it is almost unfathomable to think that we could be eating that much of the time. And so but, and if we give ourselves a curfew and give our bodies a break, that can be a huge game changer. Even if you eat the same number of those stinking calories, there's studies that show that you can eat the same number of calories. And if you eat it, what they call ad lib, like whenever you want all throughout the day, versus if you eat it in a narrowed window, say 12 or 10 or eight hour window, like you will have very different results. You will be much more lean if you eat it in a narrower window than if you're eating all day long, because our bodies, including our digestive system and those little guys that live there, the microbiome or the microbiota, they need a break too. Like one, one of the worst things you can do to have a good night's sleep is eat right before your head hits the pillow and you're going to have a crappy sleep guaranteed. Like just have a food curfew, two to three hours. It's not hard. It's free. It's easy. It's free. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I like what you're talking about, which how I talk about it. You know, the, the diet industry and the weight loss industry loves to get into this, like, now we're intermittent fasting and making it like this big production. And what we're, what I always say is like, just bring the edges in. Let's yeah. just, if you wake up and you're not hungry, wait until you feel a little yeah. hungry. Don't just eat because the world said you should eat breakfast when you wake up. Actually see how you feel. Like, and maybe breakfast gets pushed back by an hour and, and do maybe have a food curfew. The other piece that I was reading about just the other day that, that makes complete sense to me, but I had never really thought about it, was also the rise in your blood, uh, your, in your body temperature if you eat close to bedtime. Mm -hmm. And going to sleep, your body would like to drop its temperature. You'd like to cool. Yeah, absolutely. Kind of That's cool. true. And you just put a big log on the fire and you're going to be <laughs> heating up this, this body that's trying to cool itself down because sleep is, is a, is a magical time. I call it this, this detox again, like in the weight loss culture, it's like, I'm going to put you on a two week detox. We're going to drink lemon water. And I always say, you don't need to do that. Just go to sleep. Your yeah. body does it all while you're sleeping. And you don't yeah. have to go on a lemon water cleanse. You don't have to detox your body. Just go to sleep. So I love that sleep is, yeah. is a big, so sleep. And there's, there's new data behind that too, that, that looks at just what I said with this narrowed window. If you take a couple hours off each end, same thing happens with sleep. You can literally feed somebody the identical diet, identical calories. And then if one person sleeps eight hours a night or seven, seven or eight, and the other person sleeps five or six, guess what? The person who sleeps the seven or eight hours is going to lose 30% more weight, even though they ate exactly the same thing. They also exercise exactly the same. They did everything else exactly the same. And then the one person just slept a little bit more. The magic happens while you're sleeping. It's this. crazy. Can you send me this study that just came out? I'm dying. Yeah, this is like yeah I'd be happy to. <laughs> I've been seeing this anecdotally, right? In mm -hmm. my career for 20 years, right? If I could get, that's why sleep's a pillar. 
because yeah. if I could get people, and I always joke, you can't sleep and eat, right? Yeah, that's true too. <laughs> but, but the truth is that, that, that there's so much going on there is so, so critically important. So, okay. So sleep is one of your so big, sleep, that's like a, um, big a big lever. The other lever, I don't think we've talked about yet. And I, I don't recall if it's one of your six things, but it's stress. Stress yeah. is another lever. Yeah. Um, because right now, I mean, we all know in the last couple of years, we've been under a tremendous amount of stress. We've all, I think, especially in the last couple of years, experienced this phenomenon where we're tired, right? We're, we're, our, we're exhausted. Our bodies are just like, oh my gosh, I'm just, I've been through this crazy day, but yet we are like this, we're wired, we're tired and we're wired. And one of the biggest causes of that is stress and stress comes from every angle. Some of it we invite in, like if we're looking at this all day long and we never put it down or the news is on all day long, we've invited that in. <laughs> like that's a little bit our fault. Then there's other stress that just happens. You know, sure. you might get in a car accident. You might have this happen, you know, what, whatever. Like there's just stuff that happens that you can't have any control over. The cool thing is we always, think about that, always have control of our response and our meaning that we attach to whatever happens to it be it something we invited like the news or something that just happened, we still get to decide our response and the meaning that we attach to it. And this is one of my favorite studies to talk about. 2012 landmark study, 180,000 people. That's huge. Yeah. They literally took people and said, hey, tell me if you have small amount of stress, medium amount of stress, or a high level of stress. And then they asked him a second question and said, do you believe that stress to be harmful to your health? Is it bad for you? And guess what? The group that had the highest amount of stress and they believed that it was bad for them, they had like a 34% higher risk of dying sooner. Like they believed it. And the other thing that's really, really cool, and this is where I want to make the point, is in that same group of high stress, those that believed that it was not harmful to their health, that it could actually be empowering, that they could grow from it, the so-called growth mindset, those people not only did it not make them die younger or have more health problems, but it was actually the opposite. It was protective. They actually lived better, longer, had less health problems, yet they had the highest amount of stress. So what happens right here between our ears is actually one of the most important things because we're all going to be exposed to stress. And I think of late, more common than ever before, but we get to decide what meaning we attach to it. Then there's lots of fun things we can do, right? We can do breath work. We can do exercise, which is my favorite. There's so many cool things we can do to, to be able to, you know, respond to our stressful situations, but yeah. there's also just the simple thing that we get to do right between our ears. And it is magical it's and we so have control. Magical. And that's so great. Do you have an example of that? Like just, I think that would be super helpful for folks is like of how you respond that maybe the one that you use all the time. I keep thinking the way that we talk often when we're stressed out about our weight or our food take intake or what the scale said or, you know, things like that. I say, Oh, you know what? This is like, this is the response I give is always, isn't that interesting? Yeah. Right? Like rather than making it something that's bad, isn't it interesting? And what can I learn? I love from this it. How, right. So it's like this total shift in how one thing is perceived as bad and, and, and out of our control and that we're failing or, Ah, interesting. Interesting. Worked out yesterday, and and then you become curious because of because of the way you framed something that you might have re received as stressful information. Yeah, now, I have a mnemonic for that. You know, all good doctors and and those that have been through these these trainings have mnemonics. We make stuff up so that we can remember it. So I actually stole this one. I didn't create it, but a friend of mine who's who's a coach who does all things mindset. And she's amazing. She's actually one of my coaches. She taught me this specific mnemonic. I, I knew the strategy, but it's called SOS. So if something happens to you, think of this SOS. So the first thing is just stop. Just stop. It's, it's okay. Just you have a second. My kids always get me on this because they're like, they want you to respond every time, like in seconds, we just get used to hitting something on our phone and have something happen. Well, sometimes we just need to stop. That's the S, the first one. O is oxygenate, take a mm. deep breath or take a couple of deep breaths. Okay, all right. Are we in imminent danger? Like if we need to get out of the road because there's a car coming, just get the heck out of the road. Like, duh, I get that. But if it's something that you can actually pause for a brief moment, take a couple of deep breaths. And then the, the second S, SOS, is just seek more information. And this would be where you say, oh, isn't that interesting? 
you know, it's all about the language that we use. It's how we talk to ourselves. Language is so powerful. You know, yeah. uh, my favorite example of this, and this was something I think I heard years ago from like a Tony Robbins seminar or something is there was a guy that he was coaching, you know, one of these, um, you know, super, super successful financial dudes. And, and he used to say this when he was really irritated and he wanted to just scream and say four letter words, he would just say exactly what Liz said. He would say, oh, isn't that interesting? Or he'd say, if he was really mad, he'd say, huh, I'm a little peeved right now. And Tony's <laughs> like, peeved? What the heck is peeved? Like, <laughs> it was just funny. Like it, the whole yeah. room would just kind of start laughing and, yeah. and then people would start smiling. And then they would talk about how they could you know, remedy the situation as opposed to scream and yell at each other. It's all about the language. It's how we talk to ourselves. Like just because you might've had an extra Oreo cookie. So what, so what, who cares? We're all human. No big deal. We, we can. Okay. Then you just say, okay, that's interesting. How did I feel after? Oh, what could I do next time? You know, you just start talking to yourself of how you can in the next situation, what could you do differently? Like, don't be, don't be super hard on yourself. That never works. Cause then you want to get the third Oreo and the fourth and the fifth. And you're like, screw that. I'm just going to eat the whole package, you know, cause I feel bad at myself. I already, I already, you know, blew it for the day. Why not just make it a major, whatever, you know, and that's yeah. not just, just kind of keep it interesting. I love what you said. You use one of my favorite words, which is that you are inquisitive, that you like to ask questions, just find out more information, just, you know, get more, you know, I forget what word did you say? It wasn't inquisitive. It was curious. Yes. Oh, well, and that's one of my favorite there's, words. There's emerging brain science right now around if you can tap into curiosity, you know, that there is an ability to make longer term changes, right? I'm curious as to, you know, why I'm feeling the way I'm feeling right now, as opposed to labeling it as bad, good, or, or something else, and then having that reaction to it, but becoming curious. And there, there's this sort of learning around adults really stop being curious at a certain point. They really, and our children, if we watch them, and I know you have some younger children too, like they're very curious about everything. They turn over, and why is it this shape? Why is it this color? Why does it look like that, dad? Like, what is this? You know, they're constantly, and, and we stop doing that at some point and pretend that as if we understand and know everything. And that that's a very dangerous place to come from. So curiosity is very healthy for us. Yeah, it's super healthy. And that dumb phrase that we always tell ourselves, curiosity killed the cat. Like, that's just so ridiculous. Right? <laughs> right? Curiosity is what actually wakes me up every morning excited about the day. Like, I'm such a nerd. I'm always reading. And I love to find out the latest science, the latest this and the that. Like, I just, I, I, it's, it's contagious too. Like, and not only is it positive for your own self-talk to be curious, but it's just a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> I it, love it. It is. It's super attractive, right? Like it's a, contagious because people want to know what you're, what you're, you've been learning in your curiosity, right? So that it is, it's a very contagious and attractive uh, quality to, to really harvest. Um, so I know we're getting to the end of the hour here. I want to give everyone a chance. Oh, any recommendation on supplements when one has an averagely good diet? Yeah. So supplements are a funny thing. Um, if you would ask me this question two decades ago, I would have said, you know what, just food first, get everything from food. But to be honest right now in present day, 2022, a lot of our food, even if it's the best quality, organic, whatever, well-raised there's still deficiencies. We've changed so many things in the last couple hundred years with our soils and like magnesium, for example, is one of the yeah. biggest deficiencies we see almost 70, 80%, depends on what study you look at, but functionally deficient, probably 80 to 90% of us in the U S are functionally de deficient in magnesium. Magnesium, you have to have for almost every reaction that occurs in your body, including the one that keeps you alive with every breath, that one that produces energy called ATP, you have to have magnesium for that. It's a cofactor in that enzyme in that reaction there. And so, um, so there are some supplements that I would highly recommend. Um, one is magnesium. My favorite is magnesium three and eight, because that actually can go into the brain across the brain blood barrier. And so it can help with also relaxation. It can help with sleep. Somebody asked, or somebody said in the chat, something about sleep. That's one of my favorite sleep hacks besides making it cold and dark and quiet is having some magnesium. And I, I take it every night, magnesium glycinate. It's also tremendous for your mind, for your, ah, there's just endless benefits. So magnesium is one of my biggest uh, fish oil or omega-3 fatty acids, DHA and EPA. 
That's probably my number two, super important. Most of us don't get enough of that in the diet. I could talk for an hour about that, but it's also anti-inflammatory. And today I even shared on my Instagram, a post about anti-inflammatory foods. And one of them is the fatty fish like salmon. And, and guess what? That fish is colorful. If you've ever bought fresh salmon, like the color jumps out at you. If you've bought the fish in Hawaii, when they first get it off the boat, the ahi tuna, like it's colorful. If you let it sit for a day or two, it kind of turns grayish. But when you first buy it, it's colorful. It's, it, 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 it uses that same rule that we've been talking about, the, yeah, colorful, the colorful food, food. but the omega threes are amazing. And um, sadly, you can't get them very well from plants. And that's just the reality. Um, there is some algae, the oils from that, that do have some omegas, but there's actually a process in the body that you have to go through to make it into the uh, form that we can actually use. And that process is only about 10% effective in the average person. So 90% of that can't be converted into the active forms of the DHA and the EPA that we actually need. So, so sadly, it's just better to get that from fish or actually, I don't know if anybody likes the eggs like caviar or salmon eggs, like those actually are super dense with these um, omega-3 fatty acids, or you can just buy a supplement. I actually, when I'm not in Hawaii, I take a supplement because yeah. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm spoiled when I'm in Hawaii. I eat fish all the time. I don't worry about yeah. it when I'm not in Hawaii. I rarely eat fish because if I'm not by an ocean, I just don't want to eat fish. That's probably not fresh. So I do use a uh, supplement for omega threes. So those are my top three. Um, there's also, if you talk about a multivitamin, I could talk about that for a little while, but the main thing I would look for in a multivitamin is that it has the bioavailable forms of the nutrients that we most need. For example, folate and vitamin B12. B12 is a super common deficiency out there, not only worldwide, but especially in folks that tend to be more plant heavy or, or vegetarian, vegan, et cetera, because it's mostly in animal products. Um, you can get it in a vitamin form. And so when you get that in your multi, make sure it has the word methyl in there, methylation. So our body uses things like folate and B12 when they are methylated. Methylated is sort of like you can envision as the active form. And unfortunately, if you go to whatever, you know, supplement store that's close to you, 90 plus percent of those vitamins do not have the methylated form of cobalamin, which is B12 or folate. For example, they put the chemically derived synthesized one in a lab called folic acid, or um, they put vitamin B12, but it, it just says the B12 and it doesn't have the methyl B12 or the methyl cobalamin. So methylated vitamins are going to have more um, usefulness in the body because they're the form that we usually would have. And if we eat it in food, like in, in uh, eggs, for example, you have B12 in there or certain animal foods, you have B12. It's, it already comes in that methylated form, for example. Also in, in uh, folate, you know, if you're eating your dark, rich, leafy greens, guess what? It has the active form in there. But if you do get it in a supplement, make sure it's the methylated form. So those are my top sort of vitamin type recommendations. Vitamin C is always one too, but usually we can get that from the diet. If you do get a vitamin C, I usually recommend a liposomal because that's just more available. Otherwise you have what I used to tell people when they had too many vitamins, they just had expensive urine, right? You're just peeing yeah. out the stuff. So if you don't have a form that's bioavailable that your body can actually use, you might be wasting your money. So yeah. supplements, I feel like in this day and age, because of the soils, the processing, the transportation. I mean, when we buy fruit in the grocery store, like, I don't even really want you to think about how long that thing was from the day it was picked, but unless it was a farmer's market, that stuff could have been picked months and months ago. So yeah. the nutrient value goes down over time. And so, I mean, the reality is nowadays supplements are really part of a good diet. They don't replace, right? They don't replace a good diet. We shouldn't eat garbage and then just supplement like crazy. That doesn't really work. Always use food first, but definitely there are supplements. I personally take, if you looked at my cabinet, I take quite a few Thanks. supplements. And if you want to know more details, people can reach out to me individually. I'd be happy yeah, to share what I take. I get to take a picture of it and show you and that yeah. sort of thing. But, but I do you're take supplements. Good. And I think that there are a few like the ones I mentioned that are a big sort of bang for the buck. And I actually have that in my book as well. I have a whole chapter on Great. supplements. <laughs> I was going to say, I really want to get to your book. Um, the, I, I wanted to repeat two things. Um, and Sandy, uh, Sandy had asked the question about, it, and I put it here in the chat, Sandy as well, that test for the um, highly sensitive C receptive protein. Yeah, yeah, highly sensitive CRP or just HSCRP yeah. is the one that you want to get. That looks for inflammation. Yeah, it's in yeah. there in the chat. And then they were saying uh, to repeat the three most important uh, supplements. And I wrote them in there, but magnesium, fish oil, 
and omegas. Yeah, omega-3 fatty acids, which are like the fish oils, DHA, EPA. Those are the ones. Those are my top three. I, I like that you're a caution and you're making me think we need to do like a definitely we'll do a webinar on um, supplementation because, you know, understanding how to read a label. This is not regulated. Yeah. This yeah. world is, is not regulated in any way, shape or form. So a lot of this stuff is garbage to like you're saying, 90 percent of some of these things in these stores are useless, will be expensive urine. But when you find the right ones and I always say I do a test personally is. I take that, I, I make sure I'm not changing anything except that one new supplement, right? I do everything the same. I add the one new supplement and see if I do feel or notice a difference in my energy level, my sleep, my wh whatever it is, my skin. I've taken biotin before, right? Where you're like, oh, it's going to be this great. You know, eh, I didn't notice anything, you know? So making sure that you really do your research, we can do some education here and make sure that that you're buying things that are, you know, methylated or, you know, uh, bioavailable in ways that that make them effective. Otherwise, yeah. you're just taking pills. And and all the usual stuff, third party tested, validated for both potency, right. you know, what's actually in there at the a quantity that they say that's in there, and that it doesn't have any bad stuff. in it. sometimes the supplements, you know, especially I hate to say it, Amazon is the best and the worst place yeah. to buy supplements, you can get really good high quality stuff. And you can get a lot of not so awesome stuff that comes from China and other places where their quality control is like either non-existent or super low. And so all the usual sort of tests apply that it should be third party validated for both the efficacy and that, that the safety as well. And that it has in there what it says it has in there, the active ingredient and so on. And, um, you know, you don't, you want to have it come from a natural source, if at all possible, it, it's always going to be better. Like if you buy vitamin C, for example, if you have it and it comes from the camu camu berry, it's going to be way better than just the synthetic vitamin C that comes from the lab for the same reason I talked about methylation. It's the form that your body is used to seeing. So you can actually use it and not just have the expense of urine. So yeah. there is a chapter on that in the book as well. Love it. Well, and you have a book about to come out. Um, and so tell us everything. I'm going to type in the uh, chat here where people can find you, mainly your website, uh, drthomashemingway.com. Just, just thomashemingway.com is the website. Instagram is Dr. Thomas Hemingway, which is just D-R, D-R, and then my name, Thomas, and then Hemingway, which I spell just like Ernest did with one M. And that's where you can find me on most all social media, or you can just type my name, Thomas Hemingway. Um, the book is called Preventable, as Liz described. It's called Preventable, Five Powerful Practices to Avoid Disease and Build Unshakable Health. And so that's coming out in the next couple of months. It was going to be out this November, but I think we're going to delay it until the new year because there's more excitement, generally speaking, about health in the new year. So our new release is going to be in January. And um, you can just go to my website, thomashemingway.com. There's a sub uh, in the menu bar that says book and you can click there. And if you want to get all the information about release stuff, uh, both the date and how you get it, where you can get it early. If you want to go to one of my book signings or events, I'm going to be having a couple of events, uh, probably in Florida and Utah. That's just where I have some places that I can, I can set that up. Um, but I'll let you know, um, easily, easy to find that out on my website, thomashemingway.com. So the book has those things that I Feel in my experience at over 20 years of both health medicine and, and just being somebody interested and curious about how to improve my own personal health, I've come across five things that are the biggest, I think, most powerful levers. And a lot of them are, are very similar to what Liz already teaches. And I have my own sort of nuance and the research. I'm As Liz knows, I love to share the current research because why not? Why wouldn't you want to back what you're saying with the data and the research? I'm a scientist at heart. Yeah. <laughs> I graduated with a degree in biochemistry. Like I'm a nerd and I, I just can't help but, but share the science. But I make it super easy, like Liz was saying, practical um, stuff that you can do daily, actionable. It's not hard. Almost all of what I teach in the book is free. You don't have to get fancy stuff. Like even for the movement chapter, which is like the exercise, I teach you how to do some simple things in your own house that don't cost any money. Like I'll, I'll just use the example tonight. If I could flip my camera around, I literally have my laptop on top of a cardboard box. Mm -hmm. Like I just, I don't have a standing desk every place I am in the world. And so I just get the latest cardboard box mm -hmm. and I put my computer on top of it and I'm actually standing right now. Yeah. Like I can jump up and down. I use the standing desk as much as I can. Just simple stuff like that. That's free. Like 
I'm not afraid to be a doctor using a cardboard box. Like, why not? No. <laughs> it's practical. Well, I think that the thing I was hoping you would share as, as our kind of our closing comment was just the, you know, you have a very strong vision around why you do what you do. You have a goal in your life around surfing that when I, when you told it to me, it was so moving for me to hear that this, this is your, this is a thing that drives your decisions. Would you mind sharing it with, uh, with viewers? Because I think they would really take something from this and be able to create their own vision. So I have two goals and they revolve around the number 100. So I am going to be the first surfer to continue to surf until I'm 100 years old. And maybe I'll live 101, maybe it'll be 110, who knows what. Maybe I'll be one of these folks like in the blue zones that live till they're 120. I'm going to get to 100 and still be surfing and enjoying my life. Because if you can't enjoy your life, why live to 100? I don't want to be in a bed or in a care, care home. My, my son promises me he'll get me a care home because he doesn't want to take care of me. I mean, typical son, <laughs> right? But I want to be surfing until I'm 100, okay? That's, I'm, that's a done deal. It's non-negotiable. The second goal I have is I want to help save 100 million lives. So here's why I came up with that. So right now, every year, we lose at least 2 million people a year to heart disease, at least. Heart disease alone is 90 some odd percent preventable. It's completely preventable. Hence the title of my book, Preventable. So I am coming up on 50 next year and I wanna live at least another 50 years. So if I can help save that same number, 2 million people per year for 50 years, that's 100 million people I hope to help with my message, uh, about preventable, about what you can do simply those five steps, that would be the icing on the cake. Like number one, I want to surf till I'm 100, but if I could help a million people, that'll trump that every day of the week. That's, that's why I do what I do. That's why I'm smiling the whole time. Like I, know, right? I just love this stuff. It excites me. It energizes me. And I'm so grateful to you, uh, Liz, to give me the chance to just share it. Oh, Thank well, you. I'm so excited to, to introduce you. I know we want to have you back. You're going to just just go just be such a, a light for us right now. So thank you for your time. I know everybody here is so uh, moved by your message and agrees with you. So um, thank you. Thank you. And we will be there for you as your book comes out. We'll rally around you and we'll We'll put that that to the New York Times bestseller list. I, I hope so, because as it does, like it, it can help more and more people. And that's the goal. That's the mission is to just help as many people as we can. So if you found any value tonight at all, please, you know, hop on over there to Instagram tonight. I actually did a post just for you guys tonight on anti-inflammatory foods. I just put it up there right before we, we jumped into this conversation. Beautiful. So and DR, Thomas wow. Hemingway, uh, I would love for you to check that out. And to share and to check out my podcast. It's called Unshakable Health. It's in every place you can find podcasts. Apple is kind of the easiest place to access it, but Spotify, Google, Stitcher, it's on all of those. And if you could check it out and share it, like that would mean the world to me. And if you drop a review, I read personally every single one of them. And you may get a shout out personally by me uh, with your name mentioned, if you don't mind me sharing that. I, I love to share what you guys are loving and learning. And so Thank you so much, Liz. This has Thank been such you. a pleasure. And I would be happy to come on again in the future with whatever oh, topic. I, I just love to share. It lights me up. It gets me excited. It's why I wake up every morning. <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you. We were, we were separated at birth as, and now lifetime friends. So oh, I love it. Have a Equally. Great night. Good night, everyone. Have a wonderful night. And uh, we'll see you again soon. Aloha. Aloha.